Today is, for me at least, the long-awaited lecture on regularization, which is something that we've been hinting at multiple times, and it'll be nice to actually talk about it formally. Last time we talked about feature selection, which is this slightly ill-defined task of given my columns, my features, can I decide which ones are somehow relevant or useful or the right features for what I'm trying to do, which indeed depends on what you're trying to do. And then at the very end, we were sort of rushing it, but we talked about search and score and the L0 norm and this idea of not being able to try all possible subsets of features. So let's take a greedy approach where we'll check of all possible features, just adding one of them, which one is best. Then we'll take that one. And then given that one, we'll try all possible second features, see which one is best. And we'll define best in terms of training error, but we will stop when the overall loss doesn't go down anymore. And that might happen because of this L0 term. So when I added another feature, I had to pay a penalty of lambda. And if my training error didn't go down by lambda, I just wasn't going to add any more features. So the next bunch of slides are basically a series of examples to show everything that can go wrong with feature selection. And Imagine you have a data set and you want to predict whether people have a certain genetic variation. And we just have some very basic features, the gender of the person, whether the mother of the person had this variation, and whether the father of this person had this variation. And because of the way that the variation is passed down, you pretty much always have the same value as your mother. So this is a toy example where we kind of know what the right answer is. The feature is supposed to be mom, and the rest should be not relevant. And we want to see which feature selection approaches would actually get that right answer. In general, you wouldn't actually have a right answer. So let's talk about that. Um, let's say you have a repeated feature. So you have another feature, we can call it mom2, that is just an exact copy of the mom column. So in that case, uh, are those features relevant? Well, that's a complicated question. I mean, we definitely don't want to throw away both of those features with our feature selection algorithm. But uh, we don't really need both either, since they're the same. So as a sort of test for a feature selection approach, if it might throw away both of these features, then we should be freaking out and, and be very worried about that particular feature selection algorithm. So this is a general problem which we've talked about collinearity or, or dependence. So you can predict some column from some other columns. They depend on each other. Um, and we need to be careful about this. So what about another feature, say the, the mother's mother? Well, that's pretty good, because if she passes it down to my mother and my mother passes it on to me, then it's pretty likely we're going to have the same value. But well, there's a little bit of noise in every generation. So the mom feature is still better than the grandma feature. And so the grandma feature, if it's the only thing I have, it's great. It's very relevant. I don't want to throw it away. But if I have the mom feature, it's completely useless, because I already know a kind of strictly better piece of information, which is whether the mom has this feature. Now I don't, I don't need to know the, the history before that. Um, so the grandma feature is relevant or not, depending on the presence of other features. And we talked about that last time, which is it's hard to do feature selection just looking at one feature at a time, because there may be dependences. OK, so 
as I was saying, if we don't know the mom feature, then the grandma feature is actually useful. Um, and so we also talked about this Taco Tuesday example last time that um, I guess knowing it's Tuesday is reasonably good at predicting whether I got sick, but what I really want to know is whether I had tacos. And knowing whether it's Tuesday is better than nothing, but it's not really the cause and it's not really the best feature. So, okay, now we just have gender and dad. So, well, it looks like there's no relevant information here. But even here, things could get complicated. So maybe dad and mom have some common ancestor tons of generations ago. So maybe there's still some very slight effect here that allows them to be related. So in other words, maybe the dad feature just has a very, very tiny amount of predictive power. And then is that feature relevant or is it not? Well, that's, that's hard to say. Uh, or here's another possibility. Maybe your parents liked each other because they both had the same gene, right? And then the dad feature is actually relevant because the dad feature might be likely to be the same as the mom feature. But it's not the cause, right? Things are getting kind of mixed up. So um, we, we have basically a, a confounding effect. and. We just have to be very careful in all of this stuff about inferring, did this cause that? And as I was saying in the last class, we don't go too much into it in this course. And we really just focus on prediction almost the entire course, except for this feature selection lecture. And all I really want to do is raise the alarm for you guys to start thinking about being careful to not infer that, oh, this feature is good at predicting, therefore this caused that. And we won't go into it more in the course, but at least know what you don't know. OK, so same kind of exercise. Sibling, you have same mom, therefore it's useful, but that's not the cause. Uh, and it, we can just make it crazier and crazier. So. Um, Looking, knowing whether your own child has this variation. Well, if you are female, then you're gonna, you'll be the mom of that baby, so you're going to pass it down. And so then you're likely to be similar to the baby, and so then the baby feature is relevant. Um, so now this feature is relevant if some other feature is equal to female and irrelevant if that other feature is equal to male. So this is coming back to these uh, interactions that I talked about. So if we want to figure out causality, then the, the, the baby is not the cause of my situation. But if we just want to make predictions, it's useful. OK, so you may be thinking this. Um, I've painted sort of a bleak picture of all the many ways that things can get mixed up depend on each other, depend if this, not that. So um, feature selection is very messy. And I mentioned that last time. But it's also useful for a bunch of the reasons we talked about last time. And so we still want to make some attempt. Um, and what's going to end up happening is somewhat domain specific. So in different application areas, you may care about causality or not, you may only care about prediction. The interactions may behave a certain way depending on what you're actually doing. So there isn't a single answer to feature selection. Um, but there are things that we can say are definitely bad if it happens. Like, for example, the situation with the mom variable and the copied one. If you're going to be throwing both of those away, uh, that's bad. So in the bonus slides, there is a big table of a whole bunch of the feature selection methods we talked about last time and which of these various problems they suffer from. And I'd encourage you to check those out. Today, we're going to talk about regularization, which is a general strategy for avoiding overfitting. 
it is not a subtopic of feature selection. But the stuff we're going to talk about today actually does help sort out some of these issues that we had with feature selection. So in particular, we talked about this collinearity issue that if you have collinear features, then the linear regression weights could be whatever, as long as they added up to the same thing. And that could cause you to select features or not select features in a sort of unpredictable way. And so we're going to take care of that today. And then on Friday, we're going to talk about a different type of regularization that kind of directly attacks the feature selection problem. So that's the follow-up to last class. And now we're going to get into today's topic, which is L2 regularization. So we already talked a whole bunch the last couple of times about this complexity issue. And that's what regularization is all about. So in a way, you already know the story I'm about to tell you. We just haven't made it as specific and concrete as we're going to make it today. But we already talked about this issue of complexity penalties. Overfitting is a problem. <coughs> when we can change our hyperparameters, like the degree of polynomial, to allow very complex models, then overfitting is a bigger threat than if we restrict ourselves to very simple models. And so why don't we somehow penalize complexity in the loss? That's really the, the theme of today. And model averaging, which we talked about earlier on in the course, does help with this. So you, train a whole bunch of models. Maybe they overfit, make mistakes. Maybe they make mistakes differently. It may come to pass that when I average a bunch of these models, they actually overfit less. And regularization is sort of another branch of tools or set of tools that we can use to deal with the complexity issue. So I decided to start with the punchline and then go into the details. So the punchline is this equation. That's really today's lecture in one equation, but we still need to talk a lot about the implications of this loss. So the punchline is we take our good old loss, in this case for least squares linear regression, and we add a term to it that is the two norm of w, hence L2 regularization, because it's the two norm of w squared. And what's so great about this is the complexity penalty from last time. We said like loss plus lambda times degrees of freedom or number of parameters or whatever. That was not a smooth, nice thing that we know how to optimize, right? So we had to try it with a whole bunch of different values of parameters and have sort of a slow method. But here we have a loss function that is still continuous. There are no discrete variables. There's just the two norm of w. It's still convex. We can still apply the methods that we've learned for minimizing these loss functions. And I just need to convince you that the norm of the w vector has anything to do with the number of parameters of the complexity. Because if you're sitting there thinking this is ridiculous, what does the size of a vector have to do with the complexity of the model? That, that's fine. That, that's a very reasonable reaction to this. But we need to, that's what we need to talk about today and have a lecture on this is what is this actually doing and why does this actually work? So any questions about the setup? And we'll go into the details. So you don't need to ask about that yet. But any questions about the, the big picture setup? OK, let's see what we have here. OK, so we have lambda. We talked about lambda a bit before. Lambda is another hyperparameter. We'll talk about that more. But it controls the strength of the regularization. Um, it says on the slide lambda greater than 0. But if lambda equals 0, 
is just no regularization. So we can just think of no regularization as a special case of this when lambda is 0. <coughs> OK, so in terms of the fundamental trade-off, lambda increases changing error. I think, since we've already talked about optimization, you guys are now equipped to really appreciate why, just look at this and say, oh, of course it increases training error. So why is that? Because before our loss was literally the training error without the regularization. So we are m minimizing with respect to W the training error. That means get me the lowest possible training error. So how could it be better if I just start messing with the loss? Now I'm minimizing some other function. How could it be better than the best thing? So that's why training error goes up. Why test error goes down, this is not so clear, and this we need to talk about. <clears throat> Any questions on the intuition of why training error goes up? Because this is a fundamental point. Edwin. Can you explain why large W uh, cause overfeeding? I will. Can you explain why large W causes overfitting? I will. Yeah. Um, Masood? Yeah. Sir, I didn't understand your intuition why regularization increases the training error. Didn't understand my intuition about why regularization increases training error. So that if you throw away the regularization thing here, that's just the squared error. That is the training error. So here's two universes. Find the W that minimizes training error. That's what we were doing before. New universe. Find W that minimizes something else. How could the training error be better? In one case, we just directly minimized it. So of all the Ws in the universe, we picked the best one before. And now we just have some different criterion for choosing W. And we, without even knowing what it is, if it's different, well, it, it couldn't make the training error better because we already made it the best, so it could, it could stay the same or make it worse. But it would kind of be a coincidence for it to stay the same, so probably make it worse. Mohammed. Yeah. Uh, in case of gradient descent, for example, does it increase the training error, or does it increase the difference between my current point of training error and the next one? Like, I'm not going to decrease too much in, in the training error. I'm, I'm just going to be above it a little bit, but I'm decreasing it. I think the right intuition for this part of the lecture, the question had, I didn't hear it completely, but the question had something to do with gradient descent. But I think we should just abstract away gradient descent for right now. And when we're building intuition about this, forget about how we're minimizing loss. That's what I was calling step three, right? The optimization. Let's just abstract that away and say we know how to minimize it somehow. Normal equations, gradient descent, doesn't matter. We find the minimum, then all of this intuition should apply. And we, we can try to think about this without thinking at all. So this is just a modification of what I was calling step two, picking the loss. Same model, still linear. We're changing our definition of a good W. That will give us a good W. And let's not worry about how we're going to find it until later. OK, I'm going to skip this theory. I want to go into the demo. Uh, huh. Are those lights usually on? Let me just try. I guess they are. OK. Uh, how's the font size in the back? Fine? OK. So um, the way I'm about to approach this is new. I, I've never done this before, but I got feedback from a student last year saying, when you introduced regularization, it made no sense. Here's how I would explain it. So I'm going to try that. And you can tell me how it goes. Um, so here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to generate some just numbers. Uh, OK. I'm going to generate some numbers and make a histogram of them. So forget about features for a minute. Say I only have y values. Here's a distribution of y values. This is my training set. So I have no features. 
And then I say, well, let me do supervised learning with no features. So I'm going to be, I'm going to have to predict what y is going to be next. Well, I can't base it off anything. I, I'll, I'll make the same prediction every time because I have no features every time. So what am I going to do? Am I going to predict 10 for the next thing to come out of this? No. I mean, why would I? I've never even seen anything close to 10, right? I've seen stuff near 2 kind of, and of course you can see the code that generated the data, so that's kind of cheating, but what you would really be looking at is just the histogram and you'll say to yourself, well, stuff is kind of near 2, so why don't I predict 2? And I say, okay, that's reasonable. So, I mean, this is kind of silly, but you can just write a little class that the fitting, it just takes the mean and stores it, and predicting, it just predicts that thing every time, because what else can it do? Okay, so in this case, the mean is 2 point something. Okay, now let's upgrade our universe from zero features to one feature. And again, I'm just making some toy data. So here's our data in blue as a scatter plot. And this red line was that same mean value from before, 2.0 something. So we've sort of turned our picture 90 degrees. So this, the, the y values are now on the y, on the vertical axis instead of the horizontal axis. So that red line is predicting the mean. The red line is what we were doing before. It's the same for every x. It says, I don't care what the feature is. I'm going to ignore it. I'm just going to predict 2.03 every time. Just going to predict the mean every time. And that made sense before when you didn't have any features, but now we have one feature. So why are we doing this, right? Why would we ignore that feature? Why don't we just do, for example, linear regression? OK. But here comes the regularization thing. What if I don't want to overly trust that feature? I said, well, that new feature, it's OK, but maybe it's unreliable. I was actually living a happy life before when I was just predicting the mean every time. And then this feature came along, and it's kind of nice to use it, but I don't want to put all my eggs in this one basket, this new feature. So why don't I take a compromise between not using the feature, which was just predicting the mean, the horizontal line, and using the feature to the best of my abilities, which is this least squares fit. <coughs> and then, I guess we're talking about L2 today. Sorry. Um, so this new red line is our compromise. And you may look at this, and this is what I think bothered the student from last year. When I first, if I just show you this red line on the blue, it looks ridiculous. So maybe try to embrace it as a compromise between using the feature and not using the feature, because that's sort of what L2 regularization is doing. I mean, it's really that loss up there, which is saying penalize large values of W. But this is sort of a way of thinking about why it's not totally ridiculous. Ali, did you have a question? No. no? Okay. Any thoughts on this? Fed. Why do you want to compromise? <laughs> why do you want to compromise? Right. So we want to compromise because we don't just want to minimize training error. So in this case, things look kind of clean. But we will be dealing with many dimensions and curvy, crazy looking models instead of just linear models. I mean, this linear model only has one parameter. It can't get that crazy anyways. But um, well, let's keep going, actually. And tell me if you still have that question in 10 minutes. Yeah, what's your name? Sorry, Gareth. Um, Gareth. We're not minimizing on the complexity of the model at this point? Well, I'm trying to convince you that the size of the numbers in W 
kind of represents the complexity of the model, which doesn't yet look like reasonable because why is this line less complex than this line, right? But let's keep going and maybe I can try to convince you that it's true. And it, yeah, let's keep going and then we'll talk. Okay. Um, okay, so this is <coughs> pretty much exactly the same as the demo I showed you last time or two times ago where you fit some polynomial and you get crazy looking curves. So I have however many points, I don't remember, 10, 20 points. I fit a high degree polynomial and uh, we talked about this before. We had a very similar demo. You just get things that get zero training error, like this polynomial gets zero training error. In other words, it passes through all the points perfectly. But we anticipate it getting really bad test error because if you have a point over here at near negative one, you're going to predict negative 1500 and the actual thing is probably going to be a normal sized number like the rest of them and you'll just get a giant error. Okay, check this out. Look at these weights. These weights are big numbers. So that crazy looking thing is a bunch of crazy looking numbers, like these numbers, 10 to the 7. So it's like 10 to the 7 x plus 10 to the 6 x squared minus 10 to the 6 x cubed. And they just cancel each other out at the points. And then everywhere else, who knows what they do? In this case, something we're very unhappy with. So the big weights, and then once you have big numbers and you're not at one of those points where you said it has to be a certain value, you just have big numbers multiplying stuff. Who knows what's going to happen when you multiply stuff by big numbers, right? Crazy stuff can happen. But if all the W values were small, I don't know, how, how bad could things be, right? In fact, if all Ws were zero, you just have a horizontal line at zero. So now I'm starting the process of convincing you that big W values means crazy looking complex models. And it's easier to appreciate here than with you know, this line versus that line. And so at the bottom I'm printing out the maximum value which is 18 million. Okay. So how am I going to solve this? Solution number one is well, then we talked about this last time. Solution number one. Mike, why are you fitting a 20 degree polynomial? Everyone knows that's stupid because the data is quadratic and what are you doing? Just fit a two degree polynomial. Okay. I'll do that. Looks beautiful. The weights are not too big. But the problem is, and this is kind of the key, how do I know before I start that the thing is supposed to be quadratic. So what I would love to do is say, do what you got to do. If the data looks crazy, fine. Do your 20 degree polynomial thing. I'm going to live with it because it has to be done. The curve was really crazy looking and you just couldn't do a good job with the linear polynomial. So you decide, and by you I mean I'm kind of personifying the, the, the regressor or the estimator. You decide. If you really need to, if you insist, fine. Use those big coefficients. But I'm going to penalize you for it with this regularization term. And if it's not necessary, if you can pick between the simpler one and the crazier one and they'll equally well fit, now you're going to pick the simpler one because you'll pay a, a smaller penalty. So regularization kind of lets the data decide how much complexity of its available complexity it needs to invoke in this case, which is a much softer, more flexible way of doing things than just I'm cutting you off at quadratic. Can't do anything more. Then, it no, then even if it's so obvious, you have a trillion data points and it just looks like this and it's the cleanest cubic you've ever seen in your life, you can't fit it because you've limited yourself to degree two. <coughs> Questions? Connor? So if the data is limiting itself, does that also mean that it has like 
the regularization has no hyperparameters? If the data is fitting itself, does that also mean the regularization has no hyperparameters? No. There is a hyperparameter, which is lambda, which is saying how strong the regularization is. So it's how heavy-handed do you want to be about analyzing complexity? And we do have to pick that. And we can pick it with cross-validation or something like that. Ali. Uh, so earlier you were talking about making a compromise between using x for feature versus using the, the mean of y. Yeah. Would we ever want to use, because we didn't end up using the, the mean of y in these compromises. Uh, want to use it? Yeah, OK. <laughs> Thank you. I need to loop this back to my original thing with the mean of y. Let's, for a minute, live in a universe where we're regularizing all the coefficients except the intercept, which is not that crazy, OK? Um, and we will talk, or maybe not, but we should talk about whether the intercept is regularized, because the intercept is kind of a special parameter. So let's just say for the moment we're not regularizing the intercept, so it's the sum of all the w's except the intercept one. Okay. Now let's say I really crank up lambda, giant. It's going to push those w's to zero, very hard, except the intercept. And if I push all the w's to zero except the intercept, then my fit is just a horizontal line. And if my loss is squared error, that horizontal line will settle at the mean of the values. So connecting back to what we saw before, just predicting the mean is like really cranking up the regularization. And then any lower lambda is this compromise. Liam. So, saying like you have to pick the hyperparameter. Yeah. And that's pretty much the only decider of what degree of volume you is. Well, OK. Liam said you have to pick the hyperparameter, and that's the indicator of what degree the polynomial is. So, the polynomial is always degree 20 or whatever we set it to be. It's just that if the w going with the 18th degree polynomial is extremely close to 0, it's kind of like not having that degree polynomial. But it is, officially speaking, still a 20 degree polynomial. Just with small, it will hope the coefficient, in fact, let's answer this empirically. So here is the regularized version. Oh, by the way, here it is. It looks nice. Um, and let's look at the w's. They're pretty small. So see, I'm only using a little bit of, I'm using a lot of linear. If I remember correctly, if the first one is the intercept. Uh, well, now I got to check just to be safe. Sorry. Uh, depends what polynomial. OK, probably. Probably the first one is the intercept. So I'm using a lot of linear, a bit of quadratic, decent amount of cubic, but very little of 11th degree and 20th degree and all that stuff. So, um, but did, was there more to your question? You guess not. OK, great. Edwin. So we talk about so a large uh, coefficients is a problem when we have uh, a set of weights that's large, and some of them are inverse of each other in terms of magnitude. So they cancel the effect of the features out. But what if we have a, a, a set of weights that's, that are all large, but they all have the same signs? Is that going to be a problem? What if we have a set of weights that are all large, but they're all of the same sign? Um, we have to be a bit careful here, because two things can cancel each other out, even if they have the same sign. It just depends on the orientation of your basis functions. So I'd have to be a little careful about that. Um, that's a bit too muddy. Let's leave that for now. Yeah, uh, uh, Garrett. I'm sorry, I'm still not totally clear on the um, benefit of this over just penalizing on the degree. The, what is the benefit of this as opposed to just penalizing the degree? We could optimize this. Okay. Step three, we don't have this messy, yucky thing of our loss function includes our w's and the degree, which is like this mixed, discrete, continuous optimization problem that I have to pick this integer p and these weights w. It's just a nice convex continuous optimization problem, and we can apply all of our tools, and it'll be fast, and it'll be great. So <coughs> we had this problem last time with the L0 regularization with feature selection. Like, 
we had to do this whole search and score thing. It was a pain to optimize. We had to try this, try that, greedy. It was because there was this discreteness to it. But if we can live in the world of completely continuous, then optimization is much more easy. Yeah. So yeah, but I wanted to not I wanted to show you this, right? This is nice. This is a 20 degree polynomial fitting on this data, but it's regularized, so it is not motivated to do that crazy thing because it would have to pay a lot of loss currency to do that. And I don't know. Yeah, yeah it, it kind of does what we hoped it would do. Allie. But it's not come up with issues, let's say, um, like if the y values actually are way bigger than the x values. To say, like, if I, for every glass of milk I drink, I puke a thousand times, then, like, you wouldn't want to, you wouldn't want to pick a w that's, like, 500 instead of a thousand just because it. Yeah, okay, right. So, Ali is saying, what if the true best thing, we don't actually know what, what it is, but what if the true thing had big values of w? So, that is the price we pay, and as we collect more data, the data will eventually outweigh the regularization. So an appealing property would be if I had infinite data, so overfitting is, is a consequence of having not infinite data, right? If I had infinite data, what, is, what does overfitting mean? I know everything. I've seen it all, so I'm fine. I, you know, like I can just do the right thing. But um, as I get less and less data, overfitting becomes more of a problem. So the answer is that yes, it's a price you pay, but it's kind of worth it overall. And as you collect a lot of data, if you did, then eventually the regularization would become less significant. But it's, it's true, what you said. Yeah, you, if your training set was exactly the test set, then this isn't as good. But that just doesn't happen very often. OK. Um, so I want to show you the same thing with RBF features. We talked about RBF features uh, two lectures ago, and we looked at a demo last lecture. So here's um, an RBF fit for some particular value of sigma that I chose. Remember, sigma controls the width of the bumps. And I guess we can plot. And also look at the weights. Um, and here's the same thing with regularization. So just scrolling up for a minute, we get, in this case, Zero training error. Uh, we're nicely passing through all the points. And as we add regularization, we smooth it out. And I could try increasing lambda. And I smooth it out a little more. Or I could try decreasing lambda. And it'll, as I decrease lambda, it'll eventually approach the lower and lower training error situation. So, um, one difficult question. This is a tough one, actually. What is the difference between sigma and lambda? Because sigma also controls complexity in some sense. That when I made sigma really, really narrow, the RBFs did really crazy, spiky things. And as I had a bigger sigma, they were more smooth. Um, that is a tough one. And they are both sort of doing stuff related to complexity. One answer is that sigma, so again, we had these three steps. So the answer I would like to give is that uh, we had these three steps. And sigma is kind of a hyperparameter of the first step. What is the types of curves or types of regressors that we're fitting? And lambda is more a hyperparameter of the second step, the loss, which is, OK, I've decided this is what I'm going to do. And um, now lambda changes which one I call the best. Just a bit of a mess here, because it's a non-parametric model. And so this thing of sigma defines what I can do isn't exactly clean. Because now as I add more data, I can also do more complicated things. Um, so 
all that I said is, I think, very useful intuition in the parametric case and semi-useful intuition in this case. But certainly, it's worth knowing and appreciating that even in this case, bigger sigma means less complexity, and bigger lambda means less complexity. Um, and now, maybe for the first time ever in the course, or maybe not, we have more than one hyperparameter. Um, and just keep in mind that if you wanted to optimize them using cross-validation, you need to jointly optimize them. You can't fix lambda and find the best sigma, and then fix that and find the best lambda, because they, they're related. And so you've got to pick them jointly, uh, which makes the hyperparameter search more difficult. OK, uh, finally, I have this, which was a Piazza post that I made last term. And I can't go through it now, probably. But I highly recommend that you read it over later. And we can have a Piazza discussion if you want. But I, it's just working through a very, very toy example um, to really understand what happens when I make lambda big or, or lambda small. Um, the one minute version of that is when lambda goes to 0, the regularization disappears. And I just do the thing I was going to do, minimizing training error. And when lambda goes huge, all my w's go to 0, because the penalty just outweighs the, the data part of the loss. And I just end up predicting the mean, I guess, to go back to what Ali was talking about, as my baseline. Um, any questions or comments about this? OK, woo, a lot. Uh, person with the hat, I don't know your name. Uh, Rob. Rob. Yeah, uh, when, on the side where you're introducing this, you said that it nearly always produces overfitting. Yeah. What is the case where it doesn't produce overfitting? Uh, what is the case where this doesn't reduce overfitting? So one answer to that is what Ali was mentioning before. If you're not overfitting to begin with because your data set is somehow perfect, <laughs> Then, for example, in the case where we had the, the, the line earlier today, changing the slope of that line didn't really seem that great. It looked like we were just coming with the worst model because we weren't actually overfitting to begin with. Other than that, it usually should. There's a question over here. What's your name? Arman. Arman? Um, my question was that in our vector, like, we're now treating like, the weight contributed by some sort of x20 coefficient the same as the weight contributed by the x1 coefficient. Yeah. Um, but before we thought that x20 was much worse than, much more complex than x1. OK. Um, let me answer a slightly different question, um, because it's something I wanted to say anyways, which is we're penalizing all the coefficients the same amount. Why are we doing that? What are the implications of that? So one thing I want to say and not forget to say is that if I scale my feature, so we talked about scaling when we talked about k and n and k means and stuff. So now I'm penalizing all my w's in the same units, w1 squared plus w2 squared plus w3 squared. So if one of my features is really big, is scaled really big, and another one is scaled really small, that's going to get messed up because the big one, a little change in that will kill the regularization term much more. So. Linear regression, vanilla linear regression, we don't really care about the scaling of the features, because if we double a feature, we just one half the w. But here, the absolute value or the value of w actually matters directly. So it's a good idea to scale your features before you start whatever it is that you're going to do. There's a question. Matthew? Um. I was just wondering, for the polynomial one, do we normally choose it up to degree n minus 1? Uh, for polynomial, do we normally choose up to degree n minus 1? That's pretty extreme. Um, I, I would say the regularization should take care of doing anything crazy, but uh, it doesn't seem like a good idea, especially if you have a big data set, because there's basically no chance. Not even to mention that this is just one dimension, and we still need to talk about when you start with more than one feature, then you have these cross terms of the polynomials, and then it'll just get totally crazy. So um, probably not. OK, let me go back to the slides and see what we can do in five minutes. 
Um, so this is an interesting plot. This captures the intuition that I was talking about, that this is the regularization path, as it's called. So you have lambda on the x-axis and the weights. Each weight is a different color on the, on the plot. And if you go all the way to huge lambda, then all the weights are zero. And that's this meeting point on the right that you're seeing. And as I go all the way to the left with lambda zero, the weights are just whatever they would have been without regularization. And as you vary lambda, you can see they kind of go towards zero in a certain way. So it's a, an elegant picture to contemplate. And I really care about you guys having this kind of intuition. Like I have an optimization problem. I do this to the loss, like add lambda plus norm w squared. What does that mean? It's a very important to me skill for you guys to have at the end of the course. OK. Um, how do you actually minimize the thing? So I was just writing code and not actually telling you how it works. The very quick answer is, amazingly, you can still use the normal equation. So this is pretty much the only modification you can make and still use the normal equations. And not only can you still use it, but it's better than before because it takes care of the collinearity issue. Because remember before we said if we had two identical features, the weights needed to add up to five so we could have two and three or zero and five or a million and five and minus a million as long as they add up to five. But now a million and five and minus a million is penalized much more heavily. So actually you're just going to have 2.5 and 2.5 because that will minimize the sum of squares. So the collinear collinearity problem is solved by adding L2 regularization. If you have copies of features, all the weights will share the weight equally among themselves because that minimizes the sum of squares. And you could think about that and convince yourself of that. So we really can write this thing at the bottom now, x transpose x plus lambda i inverse, because it will be x transpose x will be invertible. And there's just so much more to say here and so little time. but. Um, for those of you who are into linear algebra, you could think about the condition number of this matrix x transpose x. And we sort of had the horribly bad case conditioning wise before, uh, which is the matrix wasn't even invertible. And the w's could just be whatever. And that relates to the solution not being unique. And it was exactly the non-uniqueness that allowed a bunch of equally good solutions, some crazy and some not. Now we've solved this. We've improved the condition number of the matrix. The W values are no longer so sensitive to changes in X and Y. So there's very much to be said about this from a linear algebra point of view that we don't really go into in this course. But if you're interested, I'd encourage you. Um, so I'm not going to derive it, but you can derive it. The gradient used to be that. Now there's just one extra term in the gradient. You shouldn't be that shocked. Gradient of lambda W squared, or 1 half lambda W squared is just lambda W, quadratic to linear, add the term. And then you, you still get the normal equations with just a slightly different matrix. Um, so I pretty much said this, said that, didn't say that. Yeah, said that. Um, so, oops, sorry. Um, I guess I said most of this. So the last thing I want to say, don't leave the room today thinking L2. I learned today about L2 regularization. This is this thing for linear regression. No, please don't tell your friends that, right? It is this thing for much more than linear regression. We just talked about it today in the context of linear regression. But we're going to use it all over the course. We're going to use it in classification, PCA, neural nets, all over the place. So it is a general strategy that we can use for reducing overfitting. Uh, and today's just the tip of the iceberg. Finally, this overall intuition is very important to me. All this time, we were trying to minimize training error. But why were we doing that? Training error is not the thing we care about. So why are we working so hard to minimize it? The overall for intuition for regularization is let me minimize something else that hopefully maybe is more representative of test error. OK. Um, we talked about the feature selection stuff and how bad it is. We talked about regularization. We talked about L2 regularization. It's a good idea. It helps deal with collinearity and normal equations and all that. Next class, we'll talk about L1 regularization. See you then.